There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades, and welcome back to another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. Definitely a crazy week in the stock market. We defy bearish seasonality just from one day after Nvidia earnings. We did follow it pretty good the first two days of the week. NASDAQ was getting slammed. SPY just a little bit, but it was mostly the NASDAQ the first two days. It had a really big pullback, almost a 4% decline from its peak, and it did recover after Nvidia earnings. And if you followed any of our ideas from last week, all three did have a chance to pay at some point. Microsoft pulled back into our first price target pretty well. eBay had a good day every single day of the week, basically stayed green every single day. So that relative strength that we saw on eBay on Friday, last Friday, worked out pretty good. And XLU actually was a pretty good safety play the first two days of the week. For SPY and QQQ is very weak, but utilities did have two green days in a row and kind of kept you safe throughout that weakness period. So that thesis of looking for defensive longs played out pretty well, even though XLU did not have as good of returns as the NASDAQ or SPY after NVIDIA earnings, it still was a pretty good safety play and kind of had limited volatility and kept you more on the safe side. So for Monday, we do have a full week this week. We are now going into a shortened week like last week. Monday, we do have new home sales. This could potentially move the market. It's a hit or miss. Just depends on how extreme the reading is. Tuesday, the most important is just going to be consumer confidence at 10 a.m. This always has a chance to move the market, give some mid-session volatility. Wednesday, the second most important, arguably, is going to be the GDP. Definitely want to pay attention to that at 8.30. We also have one Fed speaker at 12. It's going to be Bostic. And then on Thursday, the most important day of the week, it's going to be PCE. PCE is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. They prefer this over the CPI. So when they're measuring for their 2% target, they are going with PCE. We also have pending home sales at 10 a.m. And we have some Fed speakers right after the data, a couple hours after. We have Bostic, Goolsby, Mester, and Schmidt. And then on Friday, actually some pretty important data. This might be a little bit more important than the GDP. So honestly, this ISM and PMIs could be the second most important besides PCE. It's going to be S&P US manufacturing PMI and also ISM manufacturing at 10 a.m. And then we also have consumer sentiment at 10 a.m. So that drops with the ISM manufacturing this will definitely bring mid-session volatility, either up or down. It's always going to have a knee-jerk reaction, so you want to pay attention to that at 10. And then lots of Fed speakers again. We have Lori Logan, we have Waller, Bostic, and Dolly speaking. And on to seasonality for this week. You can see it's actually a very negative week historically. Summarized profit at a whopping 11%, but only winning trades at 50%. This means if you went short from February 26th, to March 1st, the last 20 years, you would only win on 10 of them, but also lose on 10. But the thing is, the drawdowns in this period were so massive that the winners made up for the losers. So I'd say we're going into about a 50-50 based off the last 20 years for the market to pull back, similar to the probabilities last week. This is our week last week after the 216 OPEX. We were expected to have a week period as well, but NVIDIA did defy expectations and brought us back up. So we only had two days and the rest were relatively bullish, almost ultra bullish because SPY is breaking all time highs just after one session. So going into this week, we do have to keep in mind volatility is back to very low levels. VIX closed down 5% on Friday. Also have the SPY closing at a new 52 week high and all time high. QQQ, NASDAQ stuck at all time high resistance but both are at a very big trend line and we'll go into those later some big trend line resistance possibilities coming up here on both indexes they are longer term trend lines but we'll get into those later they are pretty interesting and kind of give a potential for a pullback over the short or medium term but you still want to be careful with you know expecting too bearish of seasonality just after last week it proved to you you know the market can switch just in one session so the two days of seasonality just got blown away even though we had you know a good start for bearish seasonality and if you had puts you're probably making pretty good money it only takes one session to you know blow that away and nvidia earnings to do that for the market so just look at it as a 50 50 scenario uh, the last 20 years proved that if you went short from feb 26th to you know march 1st the last 20 years in this exact period, you would have won on 10 and lost on 10 as well. But overall, I feel like the market will see a pullback, even if it's not, you know, huge or anything. I feel like we probably will follow the seasonality relatively good. That doesn't mean we have to just start making lows 
like this, but we can see some pullbacks from the highs. And onto the setups this week, we do have three. I try to keep it at three individuals so we have some time to go over the indexes because everybody trades buy and QQQ as well, and I don't want the video to be too long. So I kind of made three the standard, but I do go over 200 plus tickers to find these three. I try to find the best three out of those 200 that I go through. It takes me a couple hours, but it's usually always worth it. We usually find a couple good ones, but usually they're pretty consistent. I mean, I would say at least like two out of the three every single week. I mean, they've been working out really well. So to start out here, we're looking at SMH. We had this on the list a couple weeks ago, actually, the, literally the same setup. So we were looking at this upper channel line. This is where SMH rejected the last time and had a big 2% day, uh, down day, actually even more. It might've even gone negative 2.5%, but it did go off this upper channel line that we were looking at. So we were looking for potential resistance at this and we did get that, you know, for two days. And then it bounced off the 195.90 back test area here and kind of loafed around, but it rejected again and came back down to the same area last week before nvidia earnings of course and nvidia earnings just totally created this huge gap so with a gap this big obviously you don't want to just shoot for the whole gap right away right i mean these things take time it will fart around inside of this sometimes before filling all the way through and lots of times you will see it fill about 25 to 50 percent of it before it tries to bounce so we'll go about there and then try to come back up and that obviously depends on the moving averages as well so if you have a moving average meeting halfway in Inside the gap like the 9 to 21 combo here it will try to hold up the moving averages unless you get some major gap down or some big standard deviation day lots of times in low volatility periods like this with the vix the 9 to 21 is going to get respected and it's going to at least attempt to hold the ma's before trying to flush them so you do want to be careful of that don't shoot for the whole gap unless you have a lot of time your minimum expiration right now should probably be like april for anything you trade doesn't matter if you're trading calls doesn't matter if you're trading puts looking for downside your minimum expiration at this point probably going to be april for overnight trades or really anything with overnight risk because now that we're coming up to the 315 expiration there's only 19 days left on the 315 monthlies and usually with swing trades you know, I usually preach 30 plus days is probably the lowest you want to go for overnights because even, you know, 30 days to expiration, your theta will start kicking in a lot more even just after one week. So 30 plus days, usually the best way to go about it. For this week on SMH, likely going to focus on day trades, little put scalps or something. You can see we actually rejected off the, our channel line here pretty good on Friday. I do have a put debit spread open on this at the moment. And it brought my challenge account, you know, over $500 from $300 on Friday before it tried to reverse. I'm looking for it to at least try to gap fill maybe 25% of this eventually. But keep in mind, it is a 315 expiration debit spread. They're not as volatile. It's not just a plain put. It's a put debit spread. So it can deal with a little farting around up here. And the risk is not huge. It's literally one spread on a challenge account. But for regular options in my main, going to be looking at puts on this just little scalps maybe obviously you know you might need that signal under 207 which is the start of the gap we can even draw a line there if you want so 206.33 we can hit right click hit add alert and we'll just name it gap start that way when price taps it or if price taps it we will have an alert that is close to the gap and it could be trying to fill to the downside but also this can act as support as you can see this general area on friday once it came to gap support at a little reversal before trying to kind of chop around and sell off towards the end of the day Friday. So it's good to wait for confirmation, uh, either a, a close inside the gap, like a daily bar closing inside the gap that will set you up for a flush lower or something closer to it at least. Cause otherwise this gap start can kind of act as a structure or support. Maybe wait for confirmation. If you don't just look at scalps, obviously you probably don't want to just short into the lows cause this is kind of a short-term structure not exactly a double bottom confirmed or anything but you do have two clear reactions you have a little bounce here and a little bounce here so if you wanted to wait for it to get inside and flush that you could do that as well and scalp that quick flush like gaps like to do to the upside and the downside so that's for smh looking at puts if you did want to play this longer term or more medium term upper channel and trade back down by april expiration minimum to deal with drawdown risk because there is still a little bit of upside risk with ai nvidia 25 percent of the weighting of this etf is nvidia so go at your own risk but it's similar to a couple weeks ago when we looked at the same exact setup except this time we do have a reaction bar last week or a couple weeks ago when we looked at it this was friday's close so we had no reaction bar yet you did get that on monday and then a big gap down on tuesday and then even more follow through the next week after so that's for smh looking at puts 
further out April minimum expiration. And if you're going to scalp on day trades, you want to just be careful because they are shorter term. You're probably going to go with the Friday expirations. And those you do need to go smaller and just be more careful. Make sure you know how to manage risk. All right, next we're going into TLT. It's been a while since we've had treasuries or bonds inside of the trade ideas list. Usually when I look at TLT, it's because I see something good because otherwise bonds, TLT, treasuries, they can be kind of boring and there's not a lot of volatility. Volatility didn't really pick up in treasuries until 2022 when the Fed started raising rates. So bonds and treasuries, they're supposed to be relatively boring assets. And sometimes you will find more volatility in these than equities the past couple of years since 2022, which is crazy. And they also do have a positive correlation now minus the past couple of weeks. Bonds have actually been kind of selling off, not making new highs while SPY has been going up and making new highs. When the past couple of years, SPY has been selling off with bonds and also rallying with bonds. So the correlation is kind of coming to an end a little bit. It might be getting back into its regular inverse correlation. When bonds go lower, it's good to buy stocks. When stocks go higher, it's good to sell bonds. And that's why the 60-40 portfolio worked for so long, because one would make up for the other. If bonds pull back, stocks would rally. When stocks would you know, dump, bonds would rally. And the 60-40 portfolio would provide good returns, but not the past couple of years. The 60-40 portfolio is totally tanked. When stocks were dumping, bonds were dumping. When bonds were rallying, stocks were rallying also. So there was no inverse correlation to make up for the other. They were both dumping at the same time and the 60-40 portfolio had awful returns. So just now, maybe it could be getting back to its old correlation where it's usually mostly inverse. But the technicals are pretty straight up on this. You have a lower channel support here. You had a big structure at 93.10. Right here, this is a big bounce area. We actually broke under that. A lot of people probably thought too short under 93. You had a couple of good signs that it would go lower, but overall you had a test one, a test two, a test three, and then a test four hold that led to this rally on Friday. You get a big bullish bar here. One thing you do have going against you, still under the 50 EMA, still under the 200 EMA, but that could give you a little bit of room, assuming you get over this 50 to get up to the 200 and you could you know, take profit about there. So TLT, we're looking at calls here. I would definitely just buy time. You don't want to day trade bonds. This is a good, you know, buy April minimum, hold for a while, let it fart around, and then eventually, you know, it can come back up. I was buying TLT calls when it was all the way down here and it was looking like a lot of people capitulated and we eventually got a nasty reversal. And then once the FOMC came out back in this period, there was a big, big rally right here, as you see. So to me, this kind of looks like a value area, usually in stocks or really options or really day trades as well. I'm looking for a value area, something where there is minimal drawdown risk. And now that we're back over 93.10 here on TLT, I feel like the drawdown risk is minimal. And also if it does draw down from here, you do have this trend line support still. Obviously, you probably want to make sure it's holding over 93. It's a pretty big level, pretty big reversal point right here. There's also a little level here at 92 flat. So you can watch 92 flat as well. So 93 to 92 is kind of your zone. Make sure that it's holding. Otherwise, you know, it can sell back off and yields will go higher and bonds will go back down. But the reason why bonds went up in the first place from these lows is because people thought the Fed was going to cut rates. They thought this was peak rates, peak yields. And you see that priced into this huge bond rally, likely due to oversized treasury shorts on the futures and lots of other things. I mean, this was a very overcrowded trade to the downside and it's set up for a really big reversal, one that you usually don't see in bonds. So we've seen some historical moves in the bonds and now it's looking like a pretty good setup. I mean, overall, eventually this could get up to this little upper channel line, might take some time. And then you do have a big supply zone right here. It's a rally base drop zone. So that's a supply rally base drop. So maximum, that's probably the highest I could see if it can get up there or the trend line resistance can't project any higher until I see it breaking out of this channel or breaking over this supply. And then overall, we'll need to get back over the 100 area, which is a big resistance as well. So you kind of just have to work with what you got here. You got an upper channel line and close by supply somewhat. But it looks like there's pretty good risk to reward here. So definitely watch it for upside. CLT looking at calls, April expiration minimum, risk off under 92 maybe one or two closes under 92 and you could look at something else. All right. And last but not least for our individual tickers, this is more of a boring stock. I like to add one boring stock, at least something that, you know, might move a little bit slower that you could look at for the long term. Occasionally I find these where they look like value areas, kind of like eBay last week. It's a boring stock, but it 
it's kind of at a value area. It's been selling off and staying in range. Well, here's another one this week. This is BMY. This has been selling for a long time now, at least a couple of years. So it's basically been selling since 2022. It had one pretty good rally up here uh, towards the end of 23. And then all of 2023, it has been selling. And likely that could be because of flat margins. So you can see the annual here. We got net margins at 15 in 2021, net margins at 13 in 2022 and net margins at 17 in 2023. So relatively flat profit margins all three years. And that's kind of reflecting in the price. You're not seeing any crazy growth. Even revenue has stayed at about 46 billion here, 46 billion and 45 billion. So revenue is kind of all staying the same. You're not seeing that year over year growth in revenue or margins. So that could be why you're seeing this negative price reflection, just kind of flat growth. But overall, they still pay a dividend so they're paying about 4.47% yield. Not bad. That's not too risky and not too high either. And overall, they've been around for a really long time. But I was actually looking at this down at this area too as well. There was kind of a little wedge here a couple weeks ago. I think we had this on the list or maybe I just posted it in chat. Uh, we we're looking at this little breakout and had a nice breakout all the way up in 253. I'm pretty sure we had this in the list because I remember going over this on a video. So we're looking at this wedge breakout and there was a nice rally. And it came back down to that same value area at the 48s, held that up as kind of a double bottom. And now actually we do have a longer term trend line here from 2022. You got test one, a test two, and now trying to break out here. You had a test three, but not a big rejection at all. Maybe on the four hour, if you go down to it, or maybe even the one hour, there was kind of a big wick here. So obviously there was some kind of pullback. This is your test three off the trend line. So there was a test three, it was just short term. So here's your test three rejection, and now it's trying to break out. So you kind of have to zoom down to see that test three, but it was respected. And people were looking at this downtrend line, obviously, maybe even just the algorithms. Another thing we have here, we have over the nine, the 21 and the 50, which is a good sign. So your overall, your medium term and short term moving averages on the one day, it actually failed to stay over it back here. But now you have three consecutive closes over the 50, which is a pretty good sign because you only have one consecutive close, maybe two right here. I guess you could count this, but it's not a convincing close. This is three convincing bars over the 50. You have the nine crossing over the 21 to the upside. That's why you see this little cross here. And now it kind of looks like it's starting to meet its bottom a little bit. So if you buy April expiration minimum, calls could be good on this. This is also just a good long-term hold, I think, as well. This is kind of a value area. So you really have no growth in margins and also no growth in revenue either the past couple of years. But this could be a good comeback story eventually. And even if you're just patient and hell, they are still paying a dividend as well. So even though... You're not really getting any gains on equity the past couple of years. They are still paying you out to hold. So if you can bet on a growth story here and a little comeback on a year over year basis, this could be a good long term hold and you would still be getting a dividend regardless. So that's for BMY here. You're looking pretty bullish over your 9, 21 and 50 moving average starting to break out of this little downtrend line. Also looking pretty oversold. You got strong support off the 48s. So maybe you can get up to the 200 EMA overall. But BMY looking at calls, just be patient. It's a health care name and it can feel a little slow all right next we're going into the spy so last week we had slight resistance at the 50s. we we're looking at this short-term res right here i mentioned that this candle could be setting up for a potential downside move at least into demand or the trend line we did get that directly on tuesday right away it actually tried to hold up on tuesday was able to close over it and then even on wednesday it broke under it tapped the rally base rally demand we've been looking at the past couple weeks also bounced off here 9 21 EMA combo once again like I say every single week focus on your 9 and 21 EMA combos for a trend gauge don't get too bearish until it breaks under and it just reminded us again why so just off this one candle here this one reversal off the 21 that led to Nvidia's earnings and a major gap up two percent defying any bearish seasonality for the week but you still want to be careful at these levels this is relatively overbought just as it was right here and you will need you know some type of pullback before making another leg higher in my opinion always need some type of short-term pullback to lead to another leg unless you're in a total blow off top breakout and we're not really seeing any crazy like volume on this breakout so i think the volume could have been a little bit higher to kind of confirm this as a big breakout and we really didn't get that only just right above average 
barely on this breakout candle. But overall, the same structure from last week's bounce right here, this rally based rally demand that held up right here as well. You had to close just over the trend line. So you weren't able to break under the trend line with conviction. And then also your nine and 21 EMA combo led to another move higher. So obviously your demand 21 EMA and your trend line have kind of been the discount area you want to be able to go long at and maybe not chase these breakouts because eventually they kind of do pull back before trying to make another leg and you don't want to get caught at the top. You want to find that value area and your value areas are going to be at the moving averages, at demand, or at a trend line. So for this week, we really don't have any crazy resistance for the short term. I mean, just this 510 where it's slightly rejected on Friday and it's not much, right? I mean, it's just this little peak from Friday. Uh, you can mark that. On the higher time frames. you really have to zoom out to find any resistance. And one thing we'll look at, I'll go ahead and remove everything. So if we go all the way from the dot-com bubbles peak at the year 2000, and we go all the way to the 2021 peak, this is a big trend line resistance. This could be a short term test number three rejection eventually. This is a one month chart. So obviously, I mean, this could take a while to play out. You got a test one, a test two, and this could be a test three. So it's something you definitely want to watch. QQQ actually had a pretty good short term pullback off its dot com bubble to, you know, 2021 highs trend line had a short term pullback two of them actually so it's worth paying attention to on nasdaq for sure right now on spy we really haven't like tapped it exactly yet but we are at that general area and it kind of makes you wonder if we are getting to that point on the more medium term to longer term pullback obviously on the higher time frames you really can't go any lower than 480 if you really were to kind of project a more medium term over some months type of pullback you really couldn't expect it to go any lower until you see it breaking under 480 which is this previous all-time high resistance so that could act as a back test area to rip higher so that's just one scenario on the further out time frame that's all the way from the dot-com bubbles peak to the 2021's peak and that gives you this trend line all the way from here to here. So it's just one thing to consider on the higher time frames. If you were a long-term investor, obviously you don't want to just buy into trend line resistance. You want to buy pullbacks, more discounted value areas. And obviously when you zoom out, this is now really a discount or value area. One thing it will probably need to do is, you know, kind of confirm a rejection at this line to show that it's valid similar to qqq on the one day we'll go over that next it will need to do that so for spy this week i really don't have any specific setups for you other than that longer term trend line you could watch that maybe look at some april puts or something definitely go small any bear bets you don't want to go too big right now because we're still trending up and you definitely don't want to short into the 9 and 21 ema combo if you're going to try to scalp these moves or look for like two day swings at these pullbacks you can do that we also do have this gap as well. So eventually, I feel like the bears will try to eye that. We just don't have any confirmation yet that it's entering. And you usually don't want to aim for the gap until it gets inside of it and you have a little bit more evidence. And they probably will need to break under, you know, 503 to do that. And then overall, you know, my thesis pretty much don't get too bearish until it actually breaks under your trend line. So that's your October lows to this point. Uh, bounced here and obviously it had bounced here as well so we'll need to break under that trend line before projecting any lower and as well don't get too bearish until it breaks under 490 as well so 490 flat and the trend line is kind of your major structure i wouldn't size into puts or really go crazy with puts until it starts breaking under those and you can start shooting for lower targets at that point but right now still relatively bullish very bullish actually holding your 9 and 21 emas Definitely only buy dips if it gets down to there. I wouldn't be trading these breakouts. They're just very risky and you're more at risk of a rug pull up there than if you're to buy a discount or value area. And onto market breadth. This is S&P stocks above their 50 day moving average, which actually really didn't change as much as I thought it would last week. I thought it would have a much bigger push up given that spy breakout. It is starting to curl up a little bit now and maybe if it can get up a little higher here, that could push the spy because this has some cushion and there's still some room to run and lots of stocks for them to get back over their 50 day. But there's definitely still a divergence. I mean, if we look at the spy, we can even remove all these drawings for the hell of it. We'll add the indicator. There is still a divergence. So while it was trending down, SPY's been making highs, except for these two days. You had a pullback in breadth here and also a pullback in the market. Slight pullback in breadth, slight pullback in market these two days. And then actually breadth and SPY went up together these two days. So that's a good sign for the short term. It's still kind of diverging though. You got SPY at the highs and you don't have breadth at the highs or really close to its peaks. 
kind of like right here. So that's definitely still something to worry about in my opinion. It definitely worries me at least a little bit. I would like to see Breath and Spy moving together for more than two days. So just because these two days had an update together doesn't always mean that it's on point and that the divergence is kind of breaking. There's still a divergence in my opinion. It is kind of holding this 200 EMA and trying to get back over your 9 and 21. It probably will need to get over the 50 here. If they can get over the 50, that's pretty good for Breath. Also, MACD is positive. So if that can continue up and most stocks above their 50 day are trending like that and staying positive with the MACD. That could be a good sign that breath is starting to recover a little bit and it could help the spy push higher. It's kind of like an RSI divergence. If you have price making higher highs and the RSI making lower highs, that can kind of set up for a short term pullback. So I'd like to see them run together. Obviously, the market moves the best when they run together. I've showed you evidence of this before. I'm going to show you again when you have breath going down, breath going up, and the market moving at the same pace together. Even this big rally here, you have breath rallying and the market rallying, you had some amazing moves here. And for this period, you just had, you know, breath going lower and market going higher. And that kind of scares me a little bit. Like you have the market rallying really well here, going up with the market, pulls back with the market. And overall, it's just, it works really good together. So that's the only reason why I've been worried and kind of been kind of expecting a pullback eventually. Unless breath can recover, if it can get back up with the SPY, that'd be a good sign. And we could just keep holding the trend. All right. And last but not least, we're going into the NASDAQ or the QQQ. So for the NASDAQ last week, I pretty much just had similar expectations for the SPY as well. I just expected both of them to have a short-term pullback at least. It was able to do that on Tuesday and Wednesday before NVIDIA earnings. Then we have this huge gap up. You can see it was not able to reach demand directly. This 420 area I mentioned it would be a pretty good area to look for dip buys or at least short-term call scalps. And I held the general area pretty good. One thing we did have, so we did get that close under the 9 and 21, but despite closing under, NVIDIA earnings was able to push it higher. So sometimes you need multiple closes under the moving averages to kind of confirm your bias and confirm a trend break. You had a break right here for a couple of days and it was able to still get back over. So you gotta be careful. Look for candles that will support your thesis, obviously. Nice bearish candles to support that the trend is breaking and it can go lower. This little hammer right here, that is not really the most bearish candle. So if you get a you know, one like this and you're under your MAs, just be skeptical. But for this week, we do have more clear levels in SPY. We have a clear 439, 14 resistance right here. We had a short term 435 from last Friday. And then we also have this new gap. So in order to break this gap, you will need to break under 435, also probably under 434, which is the start of the gap. Uh, 433.71 but you could look for you know this to fill eventually maybe buy time on your contracts to deal with that but this gap kind of leaves you know bulls a little bit vulnerable because 80 percent of the time gaps will fill eventually it could take some time but eventually they try to fill up and i'll go ahead and remove this because i wanted to show you this trend line on qqq as well so if we go to the dot com bubble here from 2000 and we go to the 2021 and ironically this actually came out pretty much during the dot-com boom and in 99 before it peaked out in 2000. So we got a test one, a test two at the 2021 peak, and now actually tapped it directly for a test three. You can see this daily bar, nice rejection here, and a short-term rejection on Friday. Nothing crazy just yet, but you are getting a reaction to this longer-term trend line. This is almost 24 years old probably a little bit older. So it's worth watching. Definitely want to be careful going long directly at it. Maybe wait for a breakout of this to kind of invalidate any bear thesis. Definitely keep sticking to your 9 and 21 EMA value areas. If you're going to be a dip buyer, go long up here on the market. It's proved to be the best value area every single short term pullback with the exception of ignoring this one. Unless you try to go long here and you still held despite the break, it still was able to get back over and continue the 9 and 21 trend. Proved it right here. I was able to reclaim here, bounce here, bounce here. So your 9 and 21s is always the best value area for this kind of trend, especially when the market is melting up. So just watch this 439 area as resistance. You do have an area 435 flat as well. Uh, we'll need to get under that for any downside. You could maybe watch this 435 as a back test area, hold it up, maybe scalp calls off of that. But you do have this kind of short-term resistance, as well as that big trend line from the dot-com bubble I showed you as well. So you want to be careful going long at these areas and stick to your value areas because it's worked basically every single time if you just you know buy at a discount instead. And then you do have this nice little demand zone. We almost tapped it, 
came very close to it. Sometimes you just need to go with the general area because if you wait for your exact level to hit, you will be disappointed. So this is a nice little drop base rally zone. We had this marked last week. And then overall, still trending over your 50. Haven't even tested the 50 in a really, really long time, which sucks because your 50 EMA is also a good area to buy dips at and stuff. So just be careful, guys. No matter what direction you're trading, calls, puts, this is just an extreme area on the SPY, on the QQQ, in markets, in AI, NVIDIA, everything. Everything is at an extreme right now. You got extreme low volatility and you have extreme highs as well. So your drawdown risk, uh, you can get hurt just as bad if you, you know, buy up here and it pulls back nasty as, you know, if you were to short a resistance and get cucked to the upside on a breakout. So everything is just an extreme right now. Keep it small, no matter what direction you trade. Probably my best advice, honestly, just go small. Markets are at an extreme. 90% of the time, no matter what contract you enter, call or put, it's going to dip below your entry. So you can't always get a picture perfect entry and you do need to prepare for drawdown risk no matter what you enter so just keep that in mind guys hope you guys enjoyed this video i love you guys i'm gonna go ahead and get this chopped up sent out edited all that good stuff so i love you guys be careful this week and i'm out